Hi, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Matt Johnson. I am an attorney at Cooley LLP, um, and we are really excited to be doing this um, this virtual event uh, in coordination with EdTechX. Um, so I'll give a brief kind of overview of what we're going to be talking about for the next hour of a hat and a half, a brief overview of Cooley, um, and then we're gonna jump right into our, our rapid fire conversations. Um, so first about this event, uh, we have five really fantastic uh, investors that have joined us today. Um, and what we're gonna be primarily talking about is the trends that we saw in uh, US ed tech investing uh, and, and a bit how that compares to the EU and UK um, in 2020 and then predictions on that for 2021. Um, and um, we're going to have a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with each of the investors to start things off, probably around six, seven, eight minutes each, um, depending on kind of a variety of factors, one of which will be your questions. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as we possibly can. Um, so at any time, if you have a question, please submit it through the platform. Um, we can see that um, as they come in, so don't feel the need to wait. Send it any time that you, you think of it. And um, we will maybe get to it during these one-on-one -on -one conversations, if, particularly if it's for an individual investor. Um, otherwise, what we're going to do is once we've had those short one-on-one -on -one conversations, we're going to try to spend the bulk of the time uh, in a group setting discussing amongst ourselves as well as uh, continuing to engage with your questions um, uh, as we go. So hopefully we'll have some, some good frank discussions, some mild controversies, hopefully to keep it interesting and, um, uh, and a lot of fun. Um, so to kick things off, uh, just uh, have a few things just to say about Cooley, just to kind of let the audience know who we are and what we do and, and why a law firm um, would be you know, interested in an event like this. So um, Cooley is a uh, global, uh, but Silicon Valley originated law firm. And because of that, we are you know, heavily, heavily involved with uh, uh, very high growth companies from startups to IPOs and the um, venture and private equity uh, firms that are most interested in them. That's really across uh, industries. Um, uh, one of the things that we do have, though, that is, we think, really unique is an education practice. Uh, and we have blended those, you know, that startup focus, that emerging companies focus with a, a deep level of expertise in the education space to develop this sort of industry focused practice or sector focused practice on education. Um, we have two, we think, really fantastic resources for startups that are interested in the space, Cooley Ed, which is uh, generally US focused, but for companies that are interested in starting to operate in the US education market, it gives a sense of the policy, legal, regulatory, other aspects, uh, business aspects of operating in the US. And then our Cooley Go platform, which is our general and really robust uh, tool for startups looking to, to build and, and to grow their business from um, uh, form generators, uh, really quick hits on raising capital, bringing in early employees, protecting IP, um, both uh, UK and US and now Asia versions. Um, so, you know, uh, a little bit about us. We obviously think we are the top tier firm for um, venture capital, um, for startups um, and for companies that are looking to to make um, you know an exit, whether it's an M and A or a PE exit, um, and, and also a, a very strong um, public markets practice as well. Um, we represent a large number of tech unicorns, uh, really from all cycles, uh, all all points in that life cycle, from very early stage companies until they do um, you know make a public offering. Uh, including a few of which are that are in the education space, a group that we hope is going to be growing in the next year or two, and, and one of the things we'll be talking about here today. Um, we're a global firm. We have offices, um, it, 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 16 offices around, around the world, um, including uh, two in Europe, in London and Brussels, um, and elsewhere uh, throughout Asia and the U.S. Um, 
One last thing, we have a, um, a series of events coming up next week that we're gonna be hosting ourselves. It's our first uh, ever virtual event series that we've done uh, that's sort of uh, trying to replicate um, what we have done uh, in person in uh, the US and San Francisco and New York and in London and uh, as well as in China in the past. Uh, so we have a series of discussions across three days uh, talking about various topics um, you can go to um, cooley.com and the events page there to sign up for any of them. Uh, and our events manager and, and marketing manager, Becky Lands, um, can also provide you more information in her, her email addresses here um, if you'd like to join us for any or, or all of these sessions. So with that, I think we can move um, into, into our discussions. And so I think the first one is going to be um, spending some time with Ben if he's if he brought up on the screen. Hi, Ben. Hi, Matt. Um, well, thanks for joining us. Um, so I think, you know, a great way to kick this off would just be um, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, about Bright Eye, how you got into this, and sort of where your focuses are in the, in the you know, education and ed tech space. Sure. So uh, I'm, uh, my name is Ben Wurz. I'm a partner with BrightEye. BrightEye is uh, one of the leading ed tech focused uh, venture capital funds in Europe. Um, and the way I got here, I spent about 10 years um, inside of startups. Um, uh, w w uh, those was the first 10 years of my professional career, uh, some of which did very well, some of which uh, crashed and burned. Um, and so kind of lived both sides of, of, of you know, the, the potential outcomes. And then um, uh, about 10 years ago, I joined the Knight Foundation to build a venture fund for them, investing specifically in early stage uh, media and ed tech startups in the US. Um, and at the time, um, there were really two big changes happening in the US market. One, a digital penetration in schools and universities where it was increasing dramatically. And so you had the potential to um, really roll out uh, software into uh, traditional academic institutions in a way that was much more scalable and predictable than, than was possible before. And the other thing that was happening was um, there was a massive increase in willingness to pay for um, new educational experiences, um, particularly educational experiences tied to the innovation economy uh, on the part of the public writ large. So parents for their kids, adults for themselves, corporations for, for their employees. Um, and so on the back of, of those two trends, you know, long before COVID, there was, there was clearly um, a lot of momentum in the, in the ed tech space and some of the um, honestly, the ed tech portion of the portfolio when I was at Knight Foundation um, included companies like Newzella and Nearpod and some of the early um, sort of uh, leaders in the space. Um, and on the back of that momentum and, and the insight in terms of what was happening in the U.S. market, um, uh, my personal background is I'm, I'm French and American. I started talking to my partner, Alex, who's an entrepreneur who's built a number of um, ed tech businesses out of, out of Europe um, about the fact that those same trends exist in Europe, um, and at the time, in 2016, when we started um, uh, talking about the fund, there was really no smart capital to accompany entrepreneurs, particularly early stage entrepreneurs who were taking advantage of those trends. And so uh, we launched our first fund in, in 2017 and, and uh, announced the, the first close on our second fund um, late last year. So that's kind of where we are today. Great, no, it's great. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think probably amongst our, our speakers here, you have the best comparative insights into the markets in the US and EU and UK. And I know uh, Bright Eye just released a really detailed and, and fantastic report on, on kind of your, your findings on that um, over the past year. I, I mean, it, you know, in a very sort of, you know, condensed times that what we have, I mean, what would you say are right now, um, you, you know, there's a sense that the, the European market is a bit newer than, than the US market, which, um, you know, I think is, is certainly the case, but where do you see that sort of, you know, going over the next, you know, five years or so? Do you see, um, uh, you know, uh, a growth um, that compares to other markets that have caught up to the U.S. in prior years? Do you see um, that continuing to be the trend? What, what, what you know? Yeah, I mean, I think so, so writ large, the way we look at the ed tech market is, is there's really two parts to it. One is um, software for existing educational institutions to become better, faster, cheaper, um, right? And, and um, that's roughly 25% of the opportunity set. 
Um, and then the other opportunity is to essentially bypass traditional educational institutions and provide new educational experiences to consumers and, and corporates um, who are looking for um, you know, technology-enabled uh, education uh, for, and, and training for, for their employees. Um, and so um, when we look at that, I think, honestly, in terms of the direct-to-consumer and direct-to-corporate market, um, that is very similar and has been very similar, um, at least in terms of the opportunities um, for the last uh, five or six years. Um, you know, digital penetration in corporations and homes in, in EU looks very much like the U.S. And so um, the real difference in that has just been the amount of capital available, honestly, um, in, in Europe versus the U.S. I think the, the place where the, there were probably more barriers was in, in traditional academic institutions because there's, you know, it's, a, it's a more fragmented market in Europe, and digital penetration, particularly in K-12, was much lower, um, not, not um, uniformly, but outside of the Nordics and U.K., um, that, was, that, that was certainly a more of a barrier. Um, I think that you know, what COVID has done is, one, increase awareness um, you know, writ large um, in, in Europe of, of the potential of online education, um, right? Uh, and both uh, in terms of direct to consumer and corporate, as well as K-12 and university. Um, and honestly, has probably made the, the, the fragmentation, the barriers across markets um, somewhat less relevant because, again, a lot of the, the, the fragmentation in Europe was based on just you know, there wasn't broadband in classrooms, basically. Um, and I think that that has, um, although, you know, people will return to classrooms and most um, learning in K-12 certainly will happen um, in physical, in the same physical classrooms that we were in in January 2020. Um, I think the amount of, of digital uh, penetration in those classrooms and the amount of digital devices in those classrooms has sort of permanently shifted. Um, so the short story is, um, I think the opportunities, uh, and, and sorry, the, the outcome of that will be if you build a solution for uh, K-12 in Germany, if you built it five years ago, it was likely to be a bespoke um, uh, solution that wouldn't quite work outside of Germany because you have to go through so many twists and turns to meet, to meet the needs of the market. I think if you build one today, it's much more likely um, to, to be, if it's best in class in Germany, um, be scalable outside of Germany or France or whatever the particular market that, that you happen to start in. Um, so yeah, I hope that's helpful. That, that makes sense. And um, we asked each of you to share some thoughts um, before the event, um, some predictions for the market. And yours was, um, you had a couple of them. The one that I think um, really stood out to me, though, is you have, um, you know, a, a very positive outlook on, on the, uh, you know, parents as consumer side of that in the K-12 space. Um, and that, you know, th this, you know, willingness of parents to pay for supplemental education services, uh, you know, other things in the home is going to yeah. be permanently increased, I think, based off of, you know, kind of this experience that they've gone through. Um, could you say a little bit more about, about that? Um, and, you know, are there certain, are there certain like components to that or is that gonna be broadly spending, you know, is going to increase? Yeah, so again, just from the uh, European perspective, I mean, I think the, the knock on Europe to some degree was are European customers really willing to pay for educational experiences because you know public education um, uh, is is such a, a big part of, of the way people learn here. But honestly, um, the big difference happens in higher ed, where you know higher ed is, is cheaper um, because most of it is free. Um, actually, at the you know in terms of K twelve, um, there's a high willingness to pay, and it, largely an equivalent willingness to pay for supplementary supplementary educational experiences for kids, and potentially even higher because the, the you know in in Europe. Um, you're much more test driven, right? Like there is there is a single test in, in many European markets that, that determines whether or not you go to university. And so the willingness to pay to help kids pass that single test, even more than, you know, the SATs or whatever the equivalent is in the U.S., is, is, is higher here. So the short, uh, uh, I guess um, one thing, one key takeaway is actually there is long before this, just a strong willingness to pay for supplementary educational um, experiences. And what's happened now is people have just become much more aware of um, the fact that a lot of those supplementary education experiences exist online. Um, and, you know, I think my view is on both sides of the Atlantic, you know, most kids have two or three hours after school um, where, you know, which is taken up by TV and video games and, and you know, uh, sort of uh, screen time, I guess, more, more broadly. Um, and and um, the awareness that parents now have that, that a chunk of that can be spent um, educationally, um, I think has just grown dramatically. Um, and because, again, there's this pre-existing willingness to pay for supplemental, edu edu supplemental 
um, educational experiences, I think, you know, the, the crossover of those two things and that effect will be, you know, you'll have um, things like OutSchool, but uh, a lot of, you know, in, in, in a lot of different sort of verticals and a lot of uh, serving a lot of different interests um, that proliferate, again, on both sides. Well, that makes sense. And we just have um, a minute or so left. Um, just one, one question um, to go on, on the other side of it. You know, there's been, I think, a view that generally um, the pandemic is, you know, rising interest in, in ed tech generally. But as we know, ed tech is kind of a very amorphous term and can mean a lot of different things. Is there a segment of the market that you think right now might be overvalued, might be overblown that you don't see um, either because of this or for other reasons, you know, really, um, you know, a, a driver five years from now? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't see it too much. And to be fair, you know, again, we look mostly at the European market and we help um, companies expand to the U.S., but the multiples that we're looking at are very European. Um, and so um, what we've seen is multiples have actually stayed relatively constant at the seed stage, at the very early stage. I think um, uh, valuations have come up a bit because there's more recognition that actually ed tech companies can scale to become unicorn plus uh, companies. Um, but I think um, in terms of what we've seen, you know, for, for Series A and beyond, Multiples have stayed relatively constant. What's changed is just the uh, the revenue, right? Um, and so, um, so when you have, you know, when you're doing three x the revenue, um, even if, if your multiples stay constant, your your um, you know your valuations go up. Um, and so, um, so uh, I guess when I think about are things overvalued, I, I just think about you know are are the you know are the, the prices of people paying kind of vastly out of line. So what I've seen so far is not not really. Um, there is obviously the question mark of some business models will be, you know, with, that have been positively, in, positively impacted by COVID will be, um, you know, will, uh, by the same token, um, see their growth diminish once um, school resumes uh, or once, I guess, once society resumes the way it was in, uh, prior to COVID. Um, but again, I think that's being factored in mostly. I don't, I don't see a ton of, of, um, of downside there. Great. No, no, that that's really helpful, and I'm also very hopeful that at some point society will resume, <laughs> uh, despite the fact that it feels like we might still be on the 300th day of March or so of 2020. Um, well, thanks for joining us. Um, stick around. We're going to uh, come back and, and bring the whole panel back for questions in, in just a little bit. Um, so with, with that, I'd like to um, see if Gene Hammond can join us um, for, for some more discussion. Hi, Gene. Hi. Um, well, well, thanks for joining us, Gene. Um, and, you know, I think, again, it would be great if we could just start with an intro to the audience, um, a little bit about you, about, about your background and, and Learn Launch. Okay. So um, I was a serial tech entrepreneur a long time ago, back in the uh, uh, com computer networking era. And, um, and after that, uh, got very involved with angel investing for a long period of time. Uh, lots of different types of companies, growing uh, women as investors and entrepreneurs as a particular focus. And um, eventually started bringing ed tech uh, companies that I was interested in, in and found a, not very much interest in the, in the angel community and investing in the companies. So uh, at that point, co-founded Learn Launch and run the Learn Launch Accelerator. And so the accelerator's been going about seven years. We've had 11 cohorts, 71 companies, um, 120 founders, two funds. We've invested about $2.8 million and our, our companies have raised about 130 on top of that. Um, some of them were back there in the low bandwidth era. So um, yeah, I sometimes joke that when we started Learn Lunch, uh, maybe only 20% of the uh, US K-12 classrooms had enough bandwidth to use ed tech products. And now it's 96%. Of course, classrooms and access, as we talk about uh, what's happening in COVID are a little bit different. Yeah, so our companies have gotten up to about, uh, uh, serving about 6 million uh, users, uh, about 450 employees, and 65% of our companies were founded by um, minorities or women. And uh, so that's sort of how we got here. Uh, we feel like we know a lot about helping companies push themselves up into the market um, in, 
in, in a lot of different sectors. Uh, we go across the board, uh, K-12, higher ed, and workforce ed tech. And so we've, we've really um, got a pretty good lead on what's going on in, in each of those markets. And we definitely think that COVID has, for the U.S., accelerated the market uh, by at least a few years. Um, uh, at, if somebody's going to buy a product for a K-12 district or a higher ed institution, it's going to be able to support remote use. It's going to uh, secure remote use. It's going to have to have um, some of the appropriate kind of uh, engagement capabilities that we need in a digital tool. So those are sort of the quick view of what's happening. Maybe a tiny bit more on the U.S. market for people. The, you know, the, the people think, oh, it's a gigantic market. Well, it is a gigantic market, but it's actually um, made up of quite a few small sales. So uh, K-12, as an example, um, you might be looking at as many as um, to reach the uh, 50 million people, uh, students that are in uh, K-12 public schools, you might be looking at at least uh, 15,000 uh, buying decisions. And uh, some states have tiny districts, some have large, so a lot of nuance in there. Same thing, uh, you know, a giant research university and a community college aren't the same thing and their needs are different. And so really we, we, we suggest carefully uh, testing the market for your products if you do want to come to the U.S. We put on boot camps for companies that do want to come to the U.S., so we definitely um, uh, have helped a lot of people sort of uh, think about those differences. So why don't I, Matt, go ahead and be controversial yeah. to start. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, so we, we, we love uh, workforce ed tech. It has consumer uh, like forces. In other words, it, it, it scales like a normal BC company. It doesn't have this real slow growth at the beginning uh, cycle that we see in selling to institutions. Um, and, uh, and, um, and we definitely think that there's a lot of consumer interest right now. But the question is, will all those parent pods stay there or will the kids go back? And in fact, if there is a, a piece of the market that has a potential to get overinvested and perhaps overheated, it will be the consumer uh, side of the market um, because, um, because we're definitely attracting new consumer or oriented capital into the market at the same time that we're, um, that we're seeing some interest there. And, um, you know, looking back about three, four years ago, people would say, hey, Gene, where did those, um, giant uh, unicorns in China come from? What are they? And I'd say, well, yeah, they're consumer-oriented, uh, test prep, after-school, STEM prep, et cetera, programs uh, that came into essentially a green field in China. But there is no green field in the US. All of the parents that had the means, they were sending their kids to camp. All of the all of the people who had, um, you know, the right type of uh, capabilities were spending money on after school programs. Or if they weren't, then the community led after school programs were spending money on the kids too. So yeah, there'll be a little bit more consumer market, but I think this is actually the one that has the potential for being um, overheated and something that could be a bit of a headache. Yeah, no, that that's actually. I mean, I think, and I think that's um, you know, I think before the pandemic, you, you would always hear you know exactly that point that um, it's not that parents in the U.S. weren't spending on supplemental items for their kids outside of education, but it was not specifically you know the the same tech focused things that that were really you know growing so fast in China. So your view is once once parents can have their kids back in camps and soccer and bands and things like that, that's coming back. It's not going to be necessarily the, the apps. I mean, I, I think so. If you and your grandfather both went to the same camp, you probably want your kid to go there. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just think that the, I just think that we're going to see, um, yeah, we'll see a little bit more education focus in the, in the toys and the games, but, um, 
we were already spending money on toys and games, right? So, uh, yeah, and the cost of a consumer eyeball in America, oh my goodness, let's not imagine that it's free particularly a parent eyeball after COVID. Right now, you can probably get parent eyeballs. They're desperate for anything, but, uh, but, uh, but who knows what, what it will look like a year from now or two years from now. Right, right. And so in the short amount of time we have left, you know, I, I mean, I assume you're a bit more um, uh, optimistic about the, the workforce and adult market for consumer coming out of this. Um, yeah, I think, I think that the, the, I mean, higher ed has to get its act together and get pathways to employment um, pretty fast or else we'll be over in a boot camp world. And, um, and, and yet at the same time, we should be uh, careful whenever you're thinking about anything in education, you have to think about the regulatory environment. And so um, there's no way that the current administration is gonna say, um, Trump University is an approved product. So, um, so, so there some classes of boot camps that are trying to get to, uh, you know, uh, Pell Grants or other things like that won't won't be able to get there. So, um, so, so there'll be a mix of issues that are going on as we try to keep quality up, at the same time that we that we make things easy to use and um, maybe less. Um, painful user interfaces, some of the current higher ed world. Right. I mean, because right now, how we assess quality is the value of the credential you receive and sort of just the, the, the goodwill and brand recognition that that comes with that. Um, so if you try to, um, but, but that's not really based on actually having skills, right, that are necessary to outcomes. I mean, what do you think it'll be? Do you think it'll be re-envisioning credentialing? Just how does that gain more acceptance to unbundle that? Well, I, I think we're I think we're relatively early in the full unbundling of credentials. Um, you know, we'll keep seeing more and more specific ones show up. Um, you know, Cisco certified engineer is certainly a a global calling card. Um, but but but. Uh, but maybe more importantly, we'll start to see a, a deeper blended mix of what we're trying to assess. So some of the places that, that there's a sort of interesting hard work to do is on human skills assessment, understanding, you know, how are we on critical thinking? What's going on on uh, collaborative and teamwork capabilities of this person I'm thinking about employing? Or, or maybe instead an environment where we're using um, an AR or, or virtual reality or artificial reality um, learning environment, how do we collect assessment data out of that? So, you know, so I think we've got a, I think we've got a lot of uh, basics to do as we, as we drive in a deeper understanding of sort of what I would sort of say is the whole, the whole ball of wax for, for education. And, um, and, and we'll definitely, and, and, I, and I, I think we have to force change all up and down the system. That's why I do what I do is because, you know, we need to make it easier for, um, for, for all the kids to get a great education, even if their parents can inf can't afford, um, you know, really expensive after school programs. And, uh, and, and yet we, we will see some change out of all of, of all of that part of this of the industry. No, that makes sense. And I, I you know, it, it is exciting that we're still so early in this, um, you know, transformation that we, we, we think is, you know, really, um, you know, upon us now. Um, well, well, thanks for, for joining us again, Gene. And um, again, we'll be back. Um, keep um, uh, bringing in questions. And um, we'll have Gene back as well at the end. Um, I think for now, we're going to move on to the next conversation, um, which is with Vicki. Um, hi, Vicki. Hey, Matt. How are you? Well, thanks. Good. Um, well, again, thanks for joining us um, uh, to, to talk for a bit. Um, and I think by this point, you know, let's, um, yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, about uh, what, you're, what you're doing at Pearson, and 
uh, kind of, you know, how, how 2020 has been from, from your eyes and, and um, you know, how that sort of, you know, impacted your thinking going forward. Sounds good. Um, so uh, before I joined Pearson, I was a banker and technology investor. Um, and I joined Pearson about four years ago, and I have in two roles there. One is an investment director at Pearson Ventures, and I also lead our strategic partnerships for Pearson's North America business. Um, and so, you know, just background on Pearson Ventures, we launched a fund in 2019. Um, our predecessor fund was a, was called the Pearson Affordable Learning Fund, and we were making kind of more direct delivery investments in emerging markets. And the goal of Pearson Ventures is to really kind of align with Pearson's broader business. So we're looking at geographies like North America, UK, Australia, um, China, Brazil, and, and South Africa. And we're making investments that kind of line up with um, where Pearson's core businesses are. So kind of higher education, professional learning, assessments, um, and employability space, and also English language and learning. Um, you'll remember maybe a couple of years ago, we divested our K-12 business. So that's been less of a focus for the fund. Um, so let's see, in 2020, uh, you know, we are also a strategic investor, so we're also thinking along the lines of, of what is going on at with Pearson's business and kind of what we're seeing um, ourselves. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that have been catching my eye are, um, you know, I think that broadly COVID is accelerating um, trends that are already happening in edtech um, and, and just giving it a boost. Um, so, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, we're seeing that online instruction is, is going to grow along with the tools that enable it. Um, this year, a lot of instructors had to rapidly, or last year now, uh, but continuing into 21, um, instructors had to rapidly adapt to teaching online and, and typically with video conference tools that didn't help them transition well. Um, and so we've started seeing the emergence of online synchronous learning solutions, um, some of them that are proprietary solutions from online um, first companies. Um, and, and those, and there's some companies that are trying to see if they can kind of license it for third party use um, and and then new companies are emerging to try to meet this need where video conferencing is not you know, directly matching up what the in-classroom experience would be. Um, but I'm actually kind of quite interested in seeing how you know, tools that, that could be used for asynchronous learning and engagement, tools that already existed, like annotations um, or kind of adding social components to readings, kind of discussion boards, um, you know, some tools that uh, online cohorts cohort-based courses might be using, uh, how that grows. Because I think that there's a reevaluation of, kind of us already knowing that lecture-based courses are not the best way that you know, many students learn. And now that we have this availability of technology that can allow instructors to have more freedom um, to move away from re pre-recorded lectures um, or uh, kind of Zoom meetings and just think about how they structure a course throughout the semester and how they actually and encourage students to learn outside of those um, that time together. Um, no, no that, that's great. And, and uh, by the way, I, I still also feel like it's 2020. Uh, we January, <laughs> January 2021 felt a lot like 2020, um, but um, hopefully we're now beyond that. Um, um, so, uh, so uh, well, I mean, one question I have within higher ed um, mm -hmm. is, um, you know, um, so we have kind of these competing interests here, right, that I think um, both uh, Ben and, and Gene talked about, which is this urge to sort of, um, you know, reform and adapt higher ed to meet this sort of evolving, you know, needs and expectations and, mm -hmm. and seeing things that weren't working, as well as this trend to sort of Kind of shift things away and, and outside of it, right? And kind of having this these non-traditional forms of, um, you know, uh, obtaining skills and obtaining you know, employment, uh, funding it. I mean, do you do you think those are compatible? Do you think that those are two trends that can continue in parallel, or do you think at some point they're at odds? Uh, so I think that's, there's definitely something happening in parallel. It's a bit of a stratification. Uh, you know, there will always be a demand for um, your traditional um, 
four-year liberal arts education that's kind of campus-based and, and in-person, um, and that you know, meets the needs of a specific subset of the population. And I think, you know, with four-year school, college uh, kind of being a little bit, or increasingly out of reach for many Americans, um, you know, that might be a solution for a subset of the U.S. market. But I think in a, in a population where um, students weren't seeing a return on a four-year degree um, or you know, that they're not matching up what they're learning with the ability to get jobs and actually develop skills that employers are valuing, um, you can see that kind of breaking away and, and, and you know, those, I think those schools and institutions are going to be the ones that are most vulnerable. Um, you know, I, last year in 2020, we, we heard a lot about how a lot of schools are going to fail and they were going to make it because they were in a financially precarious situation. Um, I think we're still waiting to kind of see um, what, what happens there. And certainly in 2020, where, you know, traditionally when you are in an economic downturn, a lot of people kind of run to higher ed and hide out there um, un until it's over. Uh, and, you know, I think outside of international students in enrolling courses, that actually didn't happen. Um, students who wanted the campus-based experience deferred, and, and they're going to wait till they can go back. Um, and otherwise, you know, students who may have otherwise gone to community college or four-year schools, I think, ran to credential-based programs instead. Um, and so, you know, I, I think exactly what Gina was describing, like, those things can happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. No, that, that makes sense. And um, one of the questions that we've actually received a couple of times has been about making um, higher education more affordable, more accessible. Do you think, I mean, do you, do you have thoughts on, um, you know, the models that we see out there now, like ISAs and in other ways to try to reform how students fund their education? Do you think, um, I mean, do you think those are long-term solutions or, or still too early to tell? I was actually thinking about ISAs a little bit earlier because um, they, it, it is a bit of, you know, financial engineering and you have to get the time in it of the payments back just right for it to be sustainable. Um, and so in an economic market where students are not getting jobs kind of right out of the gate, um, you know, we have to wait to see how long of a gap um, schools who use ISAs can, can wait before payments start coming back. So I think that that's a question mark for, for me and I'm curious where that lands. Um, but you know, one, one thing that I think could bridge affordability um, and, and, the, and the credentialing by traditional institutions is that you know, institutions are starting to brand their own boot camps or short-term programs. Um, and I think that can be a way of having an, a, um, a more affordable alternative to a four-year degree that might, where you might be able to see some uh, grant and federal loan money being used. No, that, that, that makes sense. Um, and then just briefly sort of in the, in, in the minute we have left, um, I, I know you, you, you've all sort of um, gotten out of K-12 um, recently, but do you have a sense, I know we've talked a little bit about kind of competing views on the consumer K-12, you know, do, do you think, uh, are you more aligned with Gene who thinks that's kind of potentially over, overheated or that, that that might really have long-term demand coming out of this? Oh, uh, man, I, I unfortunately am not a parent. I don't spend a ton of time uh, in, in the K-12 no, no market. Pressure. But, <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I guess I also see that as kind of a, you know, a tale of, you know, two, um, have two different markets. You know, Gene is saying that the U.S. market, it seems big, but you actually kind of break it down to these much smaller ones. And so, you know, I think there will likely be robust demand from a you know, subset of consumers who have the capital to do that. But it's not a widespread solution for you know, many Americans to pay out of pocket for kind of supplemental education. Great. Great. Well, um, thanks again for, for joining us, Vicki. Um, like I said, we um, uh, will be coming back very shortly for, for a group discussion. Thanks. Um, so I think next is George. Hi, George. You hear me? Yeah, I, I can now. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. 
Okay, great. My my Wi-Fi just kind of got a little goofy, so apologies for that. Um, uh, well, thanks for for joining us, George. Um, and um, uh, yeah, maybe we could just start off again by um, kind of giving a brief intro of yourself, of BISC, and how you got into all of this. And um, and, and yeah, what, I mean, how was 2020, um, at least for investing? Yeah, I think the, the, the background for context is, is, is really helpful given, given the year that we just had. Um, BISC education was, you know, 50 years in the publishing space, but where, where I think it's really relevant to today is in the late 90s, we got into helping universities go online. So we put the first MBA program 100% online in 98. Uh, we had a full undergraduate curriculum online with another university in 99. And in the early 2000s, we were putting exec ed programs also 100% online um, and really spent, you know, the, the first decade of the 2000s very focused on a, a value chain that embraced the entire student life cycle uh, using, you know, either, either digital tools or, or uh, service enabled or you know, tech enabled services to, to, to help students and universities do everything that was necessary to support adult working professionals that were coming uh, in a fully digital environment. So as you can imagine, that, that involved all sorts of things. It involved recruiting, it involved student onboarding and, and admissions, it involved uh, getting, getting folks you know, in class and getting them their materials for the, for the first day. It involved all the things that, that, that are necessary for retention and ultimately student success. Um, and it wasn't just the classroom, it was everything else. So you were working with all of the different stakeholders on campus. Um, you know, from financial aid to the, the bursar's office, to, to dealing with student services, to dealing with advising and, and, and everything. Um, and so our, you know, our value chain really tracked that student life cycle from uh, the time you were being recruited until the time you were trying to get a job after you graduated. So, you know, for us, you know, COVID has really been a, an extraordinary catalyst for something we've been talking about for better than 20 years. Um, when I, when I moved away from the company in 2015 to create the strategic venture for the family, not surprisingly, our focus was, was, was very much driven by that view of the world. And so our portfolio is full of things that are focused on, again, that entire student life cycle and value chain to enable using digital technology, all those different steps along the way. And, and, and 2020 has been an, an incredible year uh, with respect to adoption you know, a horrible year in many, many respects. I mean, this is the worst catalyst you could imagine. Uh, but in terms of digital disruption and, 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 and adoption, um, it's been incredible. You know, we, we tend to invest at the early end of things where we can get really hands-on and involved in these early stage companies. Uh, and so it's not surprising to see them take two, three years to get a handful of customers. Um, and some of these companies that had two or three customers and were adding maybe two or three a year, you know, are now at 80 or 100 or 200. Um, driven largely by COVID, right? So just imagine the challenges to scaling um, that we've had. And of course, because there is such demand, there's such need, um, it's, been, it's been hugely important to get that right. So um, yeah, you know, for us, it's been an extraordinary year. And, and so that, that catalyzation that we've seen, this, um, uh, the, um, you know, acceleration of trends that, you know, I think, uh, Many of us who have been kind of focused on the space have been anticipating. Do you think, I, I mean, so hopefully, um, you know, over the course of, of the next year or so, things, you know, get back to some, some form of, of normal again. What are the trends that you think, uh, what are the pieces of that do you think are, are the stickiest that are going to continue that, you know, that acceleration or that strong growth in the higher education space, where do you think these these changes are most likely to be, you know, permanent or or long lasting? Yeah, I think you know we've <laughs> I've, I've been an apologist and an advocate for for digital adoption by universities for for twenty years. So for me, this is not sort of the the latest thing. This is a kind of on a, we've been on a continuum for half of my career. But I do think that a lot of the things, you know, across the life cycle that are really beneficial to supporting not just students, but administrators and faculty and everything else, 
I think a lot of that, because of the kind of the length of the dip of COVID into, into forcing everyone online, I think a lot of that will stick. Um, I don't think there's a commentator in the U.S. today um, that watches the post-secondary segment who's not, you know, sort of admitting that we're going to be in this, this new hybrid world uh, forever, right? So if you look across our portfolio, any, anything to do with creating platforms around student engagement or providing access to data or, you know, allowing us to do um, any, any number of things, again, ac across the student journey, not, not just in the classroom, you know, most of that stuff now is going to be used long enough. And, 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 and I think there's a realization of how, of how valuable and how efficacious it is and how it really enables a lot of these things that have, you know, been done face to face for 200 years. Um, you know, there, there's so many examples, I have a hard time picking out one. Um, but you, you look, for example, student services, right? So there's so much extracurricular and co-curricular stuff that happens on a campus during a year, and it's such a big part of the student experience. Well, students weren't on campus, so how are they participating in clubs? You know, clearly you can't do intramurals, but there's tons of club activity. There's so much learning that happens, so much interaction that happens among students through student services and student activities. And, and so we're, we're invested in a platform out of Florida that you know, has, has enabled this and provided a, a back end for student services for years. Well, suddenly they were called last summer into, into service to help with orientation because orientation was now digital and there was no, no platform to do that. And so suddenly they're an orientation platform and suddenly all the speakers and all the student clubs and everything had to have a place to live, right? So they went from, I think around 75 customers to now they're close to 300 and growing fast. Right? I think that is reflected in our portfolio, and I don't think that goes away. I think once these different departments you know, are, are given the budgets and given the latitude, indeed the, the demand to, to bring these digital technologies alongside to serve these students, I don't see that ending. Because it, what it does is it provides tremendous access to data, uh, tremendous access to tools to, to do their jobs better. And I think you know, our experience is once higher ed adopts something and gets very comfortable with it, then it becomes very sticky, especially software that, that really, really helps. So I think it, it gives the stakeholders a lot better view into um, what's happening with their constituents. It, it, it makes their jobs easier. Um, and I think it, it, in many cases, it's really proven to be much better uh, than the status quo. One of the, great, you know, one of the great challenges we saw to adoption was not that the software couldn't do better things. It was simply that you didn't have the time, the resources, the budgets, uh, the support from IT and all those sorts of things to make it happen. COVID, COVID made that a, a fait accompli. And so as we see a lot of that sticking long-term. Great, great. Um, la last question um, uh, with, with, with the time we have left. Um, for uh, most of our audience are, are, are um, you know, are from Europe or the UK and, you know, maybe considering, um, you know, what it takes to enter into the US market. Um, and we've talked a lot about the fragmentation and, um, you know, you, you made the point of enormous kind of acceleration in, in how uh, companies may be attracting new customers. What is your, you know, one or two points of, of top line advice for a company that's just looking to break into the market in higher ed right now? Yeah, I mean, we're, we have a lot of uh, domestic investments, but we have investments in Europe, we have investments in, in, in Southeast Asia. I would say that student efficacy digital-driven digital student efficacy is universal. And so if you have a, a, an extraordinary product that is really focused on a challenge, uh, a, a crack in the sidewalk of the student journey, and you're really solving for that and doing it well, um, there's tremendous opportunity for you here. Again, there's not a commentator in our space in America that's not talking about you know, technology being you know, the new climbing wall or the new, you know, the new lazy river. Students are going to be making decisions uh, where to go to school based on how well universities are providing a hybrid experience. You know, even if it's still a face-to-face -face campus experience, they're going to be looking at digital technology. Again, not just for classroom, but for everything else. And that's going to become a major differentiator for universities. So it doesn't matter if you're in Singapore or if you're in London or if you're in Paris or if you're in Barcelona or if you're in somewhere in the MENA region, if you're building really, really extraordinary software that's providing efficacy somewhere along that student journey, 
Um, you're engaging students, you're, you're increasing retention rates. If you're improving data views, if you're helping with decision making, there, there's a market for you here because every university is gonna be looking to compete in this way. And in fact, they're going to need to, right? And, and that, that is, I think, the, you know, the, the legacy of COVID. Great, uh, well, thank, thanks, George. Um, appreciate you joining us today. And um, uh, I think now we're gonna move on to our, our last but not least panelist, Ian, um, who will be joining us uh, from Owl Ventures. Hi, Ian. Hi there, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so yeah, I think by now, you know, you, you probably know the drill, but yeah, give us, give us your kind of, you know, high overview take, you know, how you got here, a little bit about OWL um, for those who don't know and, and, and just sort of what, you know, what you saw in 2020. Yeah, so a little bit of background on, on OWL Ventures. You know, we are the largest ed tech fund globally that's focused uh, specifically on the category. Uh, we're now managing over $1.2 billion across five fund vehicles. Uh, most recently, we raised two fund vehicles uh, in the pandemic uh, last year, uh, wholly through conversations like this on Zoom. Uh, and we're investing out of the fund four and also our opportunity fund. And typically, we're investing anywhere from early stage all the way through uh, $50 million in growth stage companies. Um, so that ranges anything from you know, seed investment uh, checks into companies like Workera, uh, which we did alongside Andrew Ang and the AI Fund, all the way to uh, large-scale uh, growth investments into companies like uh, Masterclass or uh, Baiju's, uh, you know, and everything in between. Um, most recently, we've, uh, you know, been in the last few years uh, expanding uh, internationally uh, as well. And so uh, in Europe, we have an investment in a company called Labster, uh, which many people are likely familiar with, has been uh, very successful. And we recently just announced our first investment uh, as well in, uh, in Africa in a company called ULESSON, uh, which is uh, delivering digital education across, uh, across Africa. Um, so, uh, you know, as a firm, we're also focused on uh, everything across the learning life cycle. Um, so you can think about us from early childhood, K-12, higher ed to career and, and lifelong learning. Uh, we have about 40 plus portfolio companies now um, uh, across, uh, across all of our funds uh, at the moment. Um, my own journey and background, uh, we have been investing in education and technology uh, for the better part of uh, 10 plus years uh, and in technology broadly for 15 plus years. Uh, started my career out uh, from the investing side um, at Silver Lake Partners uh, and then was uh, at Warwick Pincus where I did uh, quite a bit of education and technology investing uh, there as well. Um, and then now here at OWL, of course, uh, you know, we're exclusively focused on uh, on the category. Um, and so uh, that's a little bit about uh, about my path and journey and um, yeah, excited to be here amongst uh, this esteemed uh, group. Great, thanks Ian. Um, so um, maybe first I'll ask you a little bit, I mean, you guys have been so active um, during this time where there's been a lot of, you know, uh, we've seen at Cooley, you know, some, some significant sort of changes in, in the deal terms that you see and, and what market is on things like valuations and multiples in the education space. Mm -hmm. what, what have you seen, um, kind of how that compares, um, uh, you know, to, to pre-COVID and where do you see sort of the, the market going with that, um, you, know, you know, as we hopefully come out, come out of this and, and move to some sort of new normal? Yeah, I, I think Ben actually at the top of the conversation said it well, uh, you know, which is that the underlying performance of, uh, you know, many of these companies, uh, you know, has frankly improved dramatically. I mean, we've seen that in our own, um, you know, portfolio. It's just that, you know, the companies are three, five, 10 Xing, uh, you know, through the pandemic, um, you know, in terms of users, engagement, revenue, all of the operative metrics, uh, you know, that investors care about. Uh, the, the other thing is that, uh, you know, if you sort of think about pre-pandemic versus, versus current and hopefully post-pandemic at some point, uh, just the, the friction and um, sort of rate of growth uh, is markedly different. Um, and so I think that's something as well that, you know, as investors kind of consider certain categories, if you went back, uh, and even when I started investing in, in education back in really kind of 2008, um, it, it took companies a long time, uh, you know, to actually get to scale uh, because they had to navigate 
uh, lack of infrastructure in the market. They had to navigate, uh, you know, difficult sales channels. Um, it was very, very hard actually at the time for any smaller companies to uh, rapidly grow. And so that's also baked into how investors think about, uh, you know, valuation and, and what, um, you know, is, is sort of exciting for them. And so I think now kind of post pandemic or, or current pandemic and post pandemic in the future, uh, a lot of that friction has been removed um, or at least uh, ameliorated in terms of uh, companies. And, and we've seen that now uh, that, that young companies can actually uh, scale pretty rapidly. And it's not only the ability to, to, to scale uh, more quickly, but then it's also the, the actual TAM itself uh, and the addressable TAM, uh, you know, has just gotten meaningfully larger. Um, you know, if you think about uh, TAM, I mean, the, the number of students effectively hasn't particularly changed. Um, I mean, just kind of overall growth of population, so to speak. But um, the, the real, true, quote unquote, serviceable TAM actually has markedly increased now uh, because digital penetration and digital reach uh, is is so um, so much more ubiquitous. And, and still, uh, as I say that, there is still a uh, a digital divide, um, as we all recognize and know. And so um, these things are still being solved, frankly. But um, but but it's it's, it's far far uh, more progressed now than um, you know than it was kind of pre-pandemic and 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 part of that is both um, not, not only just kind of infrastructure roll up but also ad, attitudinal uh, behavioral and just willingness to um, uh, adopt and and I think as a couple of the folks have said uh, already as well just the familiarity um, you know with these offerings as in comfort. That 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 makes sense. Um... So, and you, you raised a kind of, um, in your last point there is that we still do, I mean, we've seen incredible growth into, into this market, but there is still this digital divide that, you know, creates barriers really at all levels of the educational system to, to access this. I mean, what do you see? Um, I mean, I mean, what do you see out there that you think can be, um, you know, most effective in trying to bridge this divide, uh, you know, within the U.S., globally, sort of kind of big picture. I mean, is this something that we think tech is is able to solve? Does this require, you know, governments to get more involved in this? Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think is, you know, going to get us further down that line? A hundred percent exactly what you said. I mean, I think there is no silver bullet uh, around this. It's um, very much a societal uh, effort and initiative that's going to involve a number of stakeholders. Um, you know, I actually recently just had a sort of conversation with one of our uh, LPs that um, it's it's actually interesting because um, not only did did she invest in in our fund, but she also concurrently invested uh, in SpaceX uh, as an example. And the thesis for her behind that was, hey, SpaceX is actually going to launch um, you know a lot of satellites that are going to improve uh, you know connectivity. And, you know, Al is investing in companies like U.S. and in Africa that's going to improve, um, you know, content distribution and education when that connectivity is, uh, you know, again, like improved. Right? I mean, U.S. and right now, for as an example, is still, uh, you know, has gotten started and they've, um, they're distributing SD cards. Um, I mean, and so there are workarounds, um, you know, uh, to, to help address uh, some of this. But these are, I would say, you know, either bridge solutions or, you um, you know, just uh, figuring out how to get there now. Uh, but over time, uh, for sure, uh, you know, this is something that requires, obviously, you know, in the U.S., for example, like CARES dollars, you know, government investment, community involvement, advocacy, philanthropic dollars. I mean, it's going to involve uh, a whole host of players to actually solve uh, and resolve this gap. But in the meantime, um, you know, I would say that, that you know, vendors, companies, startups are, are doing everything they can as well to, uh, you know, reach as many, uh, you know, students. So the SD card kind of being one example, uh, you know, with U.S. Great. And then we're, we're almost out of time before we start our panel discussion. And I will remind the audience, um, if you have questions, we have some, keep sending them in. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure to get to as many of those as we can. But before we do that, in advance of this, Ian, you talked about, um, you know, uh, a theme that, that that makes a lot of sense that um, you know the degree moving forward is going to be less and less of the key thing in demonstrating skills and employability and, and assessing those. Um, what do you think on on the employer and, and uh, you know corporate level? Uh, it, it really does seem that that might be one of the key areas where there's this sort of just you know resistance to 
to, to, you know, to, to look into different methods of assessing skills. What do you think are the innovations that you see happening now, happening in the near future that may really, you know, um, you know change that? Yeah. I, you look, I mean, I think pre-digital or pre uh, the current environment, even in the last 10, 15 years, you know, degrees were in many ways the core signal, if you will, of, of talent and skills. Uh, because it was otherwise actually quite difficult to get fidelity, uh, you know, on skills. And so it's a, it was a proxy, uh, you know, for that. I think degrees, um, you know, will continue to play a role, obviously, and, and certainly, um, you know, very high quality degrees will, will still continue to play a role. Uh, but more and more, we're also seeing that, you know, companies really do want to get higher fidelity signal into, you know, actually what you know um, and how it's going to impact their uh, company and, the, um, and, and their initiatives and efforts. And so, um, you know, we, we, uh, we've invested in uh, a couple of companies that play along these lines. So Degreed, uh, you know, is certainly one um, in the LXP and skills market, upskilling market that uh, spans actually both U.S. and European markets, as well as, um, you know, Asia PAC. And, and they do uh, effectively a great job of, uh, you know, skills inventorying, um, identification of skills gaps, and really helping to bridge uh, you know, those skills within enterprise employees. Um, another uh, recent company we invested in uh, is, is a company called Workera, uh, W-O-R-K-E-R-A. And they're specifically focusing in on assessment and benchmarking of skills as it relates to AI uh, data. And, and frankly, also just familiarity amongst um, lay, lay individuals, if you will, so non-technical individuals, um, you know, around AI and data as well. And so, the uh, assessment and benchmarking of these skills, um, you know, again, is a way for enterprises to get higher fidelity, um, you know, signal around uh, particularly employees as, as opposed to just relying on purely, uh, you know, degrees uh, as a signal. And this is something that's garnering a lot of attention because, uh, you know, talent is, is very well distributed, but opportunity is not, I think, is a sort of a common saying. Uh, but, but the challenge of that is identifying and, and, and figuring out where that talent is and really kind of zoning in on that. And without, um, you know, these types of offerings and these types of ways to assess skills, it, it continues to be very difficult for companies to uh, actually achieve that. And then on the flip side for individuals, uh, without knowing exactly where you sit uh, from a skills perspective, it's hard to really prioritize what you need to go learn uh, as well. And so these are all important things that are happening right now in the market. Great. Um, well, thanks Ian. Um, so I think um, with that, we can bring everyone back up um, for some discussion, uh, some, some questions. Um, and I do not need to be the, the driver of this at all. If anyone kind of heard anything that they want to engage on with this group, jump in at any time. Um, I, I'll, I'll start by just asking um, a, a question actually that seemed to that, that came up in, in the questions and is an area that I don't really think we spoke much about. Um, we talked about higher ed workforce K-12, but um, you know, another area where I think we've seen, you know, um, real sort of stark um, impact on because of the pandemic is early childhood and not just the impact on children, but um, early childhood education, early childhood educators. Um, you know, what do you see in, for, for those of who are kind of in, in involved in that market or focused on it a bit, what do you see as the trends there kind of a, as we move forward? Um, yeah, I mean, we haven't done too much investing in, in early uh, childhood. I was, my, my, my uh, brother recently had his first child and I was saying that actually the pandemic not a bad time to have a first child if you know medical issues aside because you're basically get confined anyway for the first uh, couple of months and so so um, as far as I think I think there has been um, uh, you know there there are certainly more digital um, opportunities available for early childhood learning um, a couple of companies that you know that we uh, that are interesting in the space and we're not investors so I think we can be fairly objective about it um, one is a company called speech clubs which which um, is actually a a Slovenian company, and um, what they do is they uh, it's essentially diagnosis and treatment for um, speech for for kids with speech development um, issues. It allows you to assess whether your child is on track, and then um, to the extent they're not on track, help them with exercises to get on track. I think um, that sort of targeted um, 
um, and interactive experience is really interesting. There's a, a French company called La Lilo, which is around um, teaching kids how to read in an interactive fashion and using AI um, to, to um, combine um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, both oral and, um, and sort of uh, text exercises to get people um, uh, to, to teach kids how to read in a more fun way. Um, my sense is, is um, you know, that the pandemic itself maybe has increased people's awareness of, of that, but I, I think of the, the spaces that have been affected, um, maybe a little bit less so um, than, than everything else. Um, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think there is still some reticence on the part of parents to, to just, you know, sit young children in front of screens for long periods of time, <laughs> um, which is which is quite understandable. Anyway, that, that you know, that, yeah, I don't think I don't think it's going to be t t intense screen use. I think it's going to be a better understanding of what are we trying to achieve with our screen and book or whatever time. And and so it is true that K-12 is where we can actually see the impact of brain science even more excitingly than we can in all the rest of education. And so um, and, and so it is, uh, sometimes it's capturing uh, some cognitive difficulties or, or, or even a special needs level issues. Um, the, and this is, a, this is where the digital, this is where the um, achievement gap starts, right? I mean, um, if, if kids come out of poverty, they come into kindergarten underprepared uh, for the rest of their learning journey. And so, you know, the myth is that a dollar spent in early childhood education is uh, is equal to seventeen dollars spent later in education. It's probably true, but it's such a scattered market. It's really hard to think about it as business. And so, um, um, so, so, just a just a kind of a difficult area for um, for seeing, particularly here in the U.S. market. Yes, we have little regional chains. We have a few. Um, government dollars, but it, but it's been really hard. Um, changing gears, one of the things that I think we had heard a lot pre-pandemic was, um, you know, the importance of being near the capital you were seeking, the importance of being in Silicon Valley or in the centers of, of where you're seeing um, this go. And there's always been a resistance to that, but I think that that has really obviously been, um, you know, uh, made, you know, at least temporarily clear um, uh, about sort of how deals can get done over Zoom, how geography becomes less important. Um, so uh, for I'll ask if anyone, you know, thinks that that's not going to be a long-term trend and um, assuming everyone does think that, you know, geography becomes less important, both within borders and outside of borders, um, what, I mean, what do you think the long-term implications of that, of that are? I mean, do you think you see, um, you know, uh, do you think you still see clusters? I don't, for some reason, people in VC here keep talking about Miami, which seems um, to be, you know, people are going to just gather in new places, or is this really just going to be, you know, more kind of like this? So I'll start and I'll say that, you know, Pearson, we're a multinational company. Um, and, you know, even pre-pandemic, we were doing deals across uh, international borders. Um, you know, we, we'd love to be able to kind of fly out to um, where some of our portfolio companies are, but we don't always have the chance to do that. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that everyone's kind of benefiting from, from some of the, um, you know, scale um, and time saving that, that we were before, even before the pandemic. Um, you know, and to Matt, to you know, your question around like, what does this mean for companies? I think ed tech companies will benefit the same way that many other startups have in just, you know, having a lower cost base, um, you know, for where their headquarters are um, and being able to, you know, find talent around the country, around, around the world. Um, and one thing I actually have seen in ed tech um, that you know, particularly in the higher ed space, that a lot of companies end up locating where their first big customer is. So you know, we see companies in Florida or Arizona because they're um, you know have a major research institution that's their anchor customer. Um, and so you know, I, I think being closer to customers it hopefully will end up being more important than being close to your investor. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll add a few thoughts here as well, which is you know from. From Al's perspective, we we also were investing internationally uh, very much before the pandemic, and 
you know, through the pandemic, I think it's, um, I think it's a really good development actually for the ecosystem, um, you know, overall, because, you know, what happens is that, you know, you have more, uh, the ability to have more uh, conversations, uh, you know, with folks that aren't just, you know, a few miles from your office, so to speak. And I think, you know, there will still be talent clusters, um, you know, certainly in, in, in different ge geographies that just spawn probably more, uh, you know, companies as a result. But at the same time, uh, you know, if, if there is a company in a non quote unquote hub, uh, you know, area, I think there's still equal, um, you know, opportunity for those types of folks uh, and those companies to now flourish and attract investor capital in a way that was probably much harder, uh, you know, before. And so overall, I still think you'll see a little bit of, you know, there's still going to be more capital deployed in, uh, you know, hubs where there's talent, uh, but you'll, I think, see, uh, increasingly, uh, you know, interesting companies kind of pop out of, you know, geographies or cities or regions that, um, you know, otherwise you'd be, wow, like that, that, that's not where I typically would see, uh, you know, companies. And so, um, we're starting to see a lot of that dynamic. Um, you know, we're, we're making investments, um, you know, again, around the world. And we have a couple down in, uh, now in Latin America as well that we haven't uh, fully announced yet, but also, uh, you know, again, is quote unquote, um, you know, certainly not in just pure, say, Brazil only, because I think in Latin America, you, people think about, oh, it's got to be Brazil. Uh, but we have a, uh, an investment that we're making right now in a company that is, is not actually Brazilian focused. And again, in a pre-pandemic world, I think probably would have, um, you know, found it a little bit more difficult to reach the right audiences. So I, I think it's a, it's a great trend. I think it is something that will, uh, you know, survive kind of post-pandemic as well. Great. Um... Uh, so one one interesting question that just came through. Um, I mean, I think we've generally talked about the fact that um, this pandemic has accelerated trends that we saw, um, you know, happening before, and, and 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 thought were sort of going to be driven by other forces anyway. Um, and a lot of things that have been validated over the you know that time frame. One year kind of almost, you know, into it. Um, what is one trend that has surprised you that, you know, you did not see coming in early 2020 or prior to that, um, that kind of sticks out? You know, I might say it upside down. Um, uh, one thing that persisted that I wasn't sure was going to is the amount of investment uh, that particularly major corporations are making in uh, training and skilling all up and down their workforce. Um, you know, so um, when when um, when hiring was very tight, it made lots of sense that people wanted to upskill and employ that they already had. Um, and it and it's not universal, but most of the um, of the major corporations. Um, have looked at the the cost of uh, spot labor, uh, finding their exact spot labor, and 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 having the signals be strong enough. In other words, does that degree really mean that they do that they can collaborate or whatever it is that, that that's important? Um, and so so I think that what we see is that the chief learning officer is running a university. They're using products like Degreed and other things to, to get a lot of different things. But they're also working on upskilling, you know, a workforce that's in a, uh, you know, warehouse setting or someplace else. So and, and um, it's also a place where we see really interesting corporate venturing, you know, with Walmart and other people um, in, in the market here. And so I, I, I sort of thought, oh, well, when, when there's lots of layoffs and people are going away, maybe that investment is going away. And I, I wouldn't say it's hugely increased or anything, but at least I think it's the, the, it looks like that the corporations as a whole believe this is their future. That when 50% of their, of their employees say a chance to get more skilling is the main, my, main, uh, my highest desire from a job, then somehow the people are getting on that wavelength together. So I'm yeah. surprised it persisted. How's that? <laughs> yeah, I, I just to, to jump uh, or add to that, I guess. Um, I mean, I think um, so. We're invested in in some uh, companies like Ironhack, which are um, uh, 
sort of coding or tech skills boot camps that give you the skills you need for entry level jobs. Those have seen a lot of growth during um, the pandemic, and that was kind of what we expected. We're actually also invested in a company uh, called U School, which is um, uh, training for blue collar um, uh, professions. So things like uh, in France, so cuisine, um, beauty, those sorts of, um, of professions. And I guess what I've been so, and, and most of that is paid for directly by by students. Um, and so so um, what I've been surprised by is just the um, the willingness, you know, throughout the pandemic of people to, to basically bet on themselves um, in those trades, which are not necessarily like the innovation economy skills. Right. But but just, um, you know, people are, are taking advantage of the pandemic um, to basically, you know, they've seen three X plus uh, growth um, throughout this. And, and it's really just um, anything where people have access to education to learn the skills that they want, um, you know, um, and that spans way beyond kind of the innovation economy. Uh, anything that makes it um, both more enjoyable and more accessible, um, you know, is really is really seeing uh, a sort of a, a tremendous amount of growth at the moment. And so, so anyway, that, that was um, uh, a pleasant surprise for us as, as investors and, and also just kind of shows the breadth of, of what's happening uh, right now. Anyone else surprised by anything? Yeah, Matt, I think that, you know, in post-secondary, digital was really, it kind of split down one of two ways. Either you were a, you know, maybe a middle tier, less selective institution for whom digital was perhaps the way forward. It was a core asset and a core focus. And then you would have the institutions that were more on the selective end that were, you know, well-financed, big brands, where it was really, I think, viewed more as a sideshow. It was something you used for, you know, a MOOC or you used it to do maybe digital skills coming out of exec ed or continuing studies. But the, you know, the core focus of the campus, you know, that 150, 300 year tradition was really focused on that residential experience. And I think that, you know, we, we viewed adoption as really breaking into those two, those two roads um, really for the foreseeable future. And I think the big surprise with COVID was just the kind of the mass 100% across the board adoption. And I think, you know, we're still waiting to see how that shakes out. Um, but the, you know, just, just the broad embrace of every institution, not just in the U.S., but around the world, of these different technologies in order to survive and, and, and just function um, during the pandemic, I think, was just something we never expected. I think we thought it was going to be much more incremental and evolutionary and that it was going to take a long time, um, especially for the highly selective schools, you know, those schools in the, in the, in the top categories around the world, to really take digital student experience seriously, you know, and sort of the irony of that is they're the ones that have the financial resources and have the teams and the technologists and so forth to, to do it well, whereas a lot of the institutions that were willing to be early adopters in many cases struggle to have those resources. So I think what's going to be really interesting is to see, you know, as, as the data starts to come out from that broad adoption and as the, you know, the, 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 those points of efficacy start to really shake out what works, what doesn't work, what becomes standard. In, in, in a hybrid delivery, you know, I think, I think it's just going to accelerate things that much faster. I, I didn't see that kind of acceleration coming. Uh, again, I thought it was going to continue to be incremental and, and continuing to chip away. And, and sort of this, this watershed moment, this wholesale adoption, I think is going to accelerate, at least in post-secondary, you know, what we've been hoping for for many, many years. Um, and, that, and that was just a surprise to how quickly all those walls came down. Yeah, I'll just uh, add an example to, to exactly um, that point, which is, uh, you know, Labster, uh, you know, which is based out of, of Denmark, um, you know, they've seen some tremendous, uh, you know, adoption uh, during this time. And in the U.S. in particular, uh, you know, with entire statewide systems uh, and very quickly. And so the California Community College system, the CSU system, they signed, uh, you know, opportunities in Southeast Asia with, um, you know, Philippines uh, Association of Colleges and Universities. So just the, the speed at which uh, these adoptions or um, uh, conversations can happen uh, certainly is a, a, a fantastic development, um, you know, as a result of all of this. And I think, you know, again, once some of these technologies and solutions, uh, you know, start to get used, uh, you know, people are going to to, to really continue to want to use them, um, you know, over time as well, even post pandemic. And so that's something that we're excited about. I think one of the other, kind of one of the other side benefits of that is because of this sudden and, and, and sort of very public attention, um, you see a lot of firms, you know, unlike those of us on the panel who are, you know, kind of dedicated 100% of our days to, to focusing on this space, 
you've always had larger firms and, and, and other, you know, other venture operations that have either, in, you know, had a, a vertical or have had sporadic investment in the space. I think, you know, what I've seen and in, in, in globally especially is just attention from firms that I never thought would care about ed tech now are, are, are writing very large checks um, into the space, which I think is, again, part of that, that, that sort of rapid scale up um, is in part just by the attention that, that COVID has driven. So now you're seeing bigger money, more money, and, and investors that, that never really really would have paid attention to it now are pouring money in. You know, that can be good, that can be bad. It could mean that we, you know, we drive a lot of stuff that, that maybe shouldn't be driven, but hopefully it, it, it leads, uh, again, to accelerating the pace of innovation, the pace of, of, of improving on things like student outcomes and individualized student supports and those sorts of things so that we can actually achieve some of these big outcomes, these big hairy goals that we've had that again, we were sort of chipping away at incrementally. And now just because of the numbers, both the dollars and the individuals and the adoption, you know, I'm really hopeful that as an industry, we see you know, a, a rapid increase in efficacy um, in, in part just because of that tremendous attention that we're getting from, from investors that normally would not have paid attention to ad tech. Um, yeah, and, and maybe sticking with that, um, so, you know, as you've seen, you know, new investors get, get more interested in ed tech, it, it becomes trendier, I guess, um, for now with, with more general investors. Um, you know, thinking back on your experience um, in, in this market, I, I mean, what, I mean, what is, you know, one key piece of advice? I mean, I think you said, George, really well, that, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how that how that all shakes out. What's one piece of advice do you have for investors that are just getting into the space that um, you know can, can help them avoid you know significant mistakes in a, in a pretty complex area? Oh, probably call and share. with somebody on the panel. <laughs> no, it, it, it is a complex industry, and and um, people showing up. Um, often imagine that it's going to be very simple. In fact, we see tons and tons of new startups hitting our um, website and, and door every day saying, hey, I'm here to fix education. I like to joke that every um, uh, mother, father, teacher, and investment banker in America has a plan to fix education because they've been home with their kids. And so, um, so you know, just you know, don't imagine that it's simple. These are pretty complex systems that we've built up there. Um, uh, most of them have at least some degree of semi-regulation around them. And so, um, so really understanding some of the, uh, some of the complexity of that market and, um, and then, uh, you know, look, investing in, in, Ed tech startups is like any investing. You look for great teams with great ideas and great market traction. So, yay. <laughs> I, think, I, think Gene's, I think Gene's right on. I mean, we, we've had probably a dozen companies in the portfolio that have done follow-ons or subsequent rounds in the last six months. And I tell every one of them, you know, as you're speaking, and, and, and many of those have been led by people that are not traditional ed tech focused investors. And in every case, I've said to those founders, please have them call me and talk to me um, or talk to somebody who's, you know, who's on the cap table that understands this space so that there's a very clear expectation of, of how you're going to spend their money and what those outcomes are um, so that you have, you know, you can kind of quickly bring those folks up to speed. Um, you know, most of the companies in our space, um, especially those that are a little more mature, probably have somebody from an ed tech background somewhere somewhere in their in their in their in, in, in investment communities so i i think gene's actually quite right i think there are plenty of us that have been in it a long time that are happy to speak um you know, i've talked to some firms that you know to gene's point have said oh we want to help change education you're like well some of us have been at that a long time so let's let's unpack what that actually means and and what efficacy looks like um and and what you know and 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 but let's have a let's have a thoughtful conversation about that because it, it's it's not a new thing. So you know, frankly, I think this this community here can be can be hugely influential and helpful uh, to the broader investment community as it starts to come in. I mean, GSV went online this last year and they had what fifteen thousand people showed up. I mean, normally it was you know three, four, five thousand. So that tells me that there's extraordinary focus on the space. 
I think we as, as advocates for our industry, you know, need to be very public just like this. Um, and that's, that's, how we, that's how we protect it and, and hopefully make all that investment efficient. And of course, obviously, you know, have a have a law firm that uh, understands the space as well as. You know. <laughs> um, I, if anyone else has, you know, one more quick thought on this one, we do have one more question that there's been a lot of interest in that I think we'd like to get to in the in the remaining time we have. Um, and this is, you know, we, we've asked you to make predictions about trends coming out of this and things that we think need to happen. Um, so this one, we're going to flip a little bit and ask you to have some fun and either be hopeful or pessimistic or however track you want to, you know, take it. Um, but five years from now, um, you know, think think about a segment of the market where we've talked about this need for change or this potential for growth. What do you actually think it looks like? What, what is one thing fundamentally either different or potentially disappointingly the same that you think will be in five years from now? I would just uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I think one thing that we'll see certainly five years from now is kind of the future of work and ed tech in a corporate setting will overlap and, and be almost indistinguishable from one another, right? I think one of the most effective ways to learn um, is to have information close to the moment when you need that information, right? And and so um, there are a whole bunch of tools like Chorus and, and Gong in the sales space, which have already shown that if you can give people close to real-time data, you can improve um, the efficiency of, of um, sales forces and 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 um, and provide a bunch of training around that, and I think you're just going to see that across a number of different verticals in the in the corporate space. Um, you know, from everything from you know uh, litigators to doctors to you know whatever trade you can think of, where they're going to be um, you know sort of getting uh, training in the form of productivity um, feedback on a on a kind of uh, near term or real time basis, and 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 teaching as well for that matter. Um, uh, so. So anyway, that's that's one prediction. Well, I'll say something about the, go ahead, go ahead, I'll say something about the use of data. Um, you know, we 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 are now collecting quite a bit of data, and in higher ed, it's um, it's making pretty good sense. And many times we can run a decent AI analysis on 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 subsets of it. Um, but what we haven't done is really think about the use of data across um, entire learning pathways or understanding how, uh, how different, um, uh, I don't know, rest of education, let's say the, 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 um, campus, the campus life part of, of campus uh, mixed in with the academic part um, can, can, um, can show us uh, more information to, to, to grow what's happening. And so, so I think we'll just keep seeing that. Uh, K-12, we still have really dirty data. We, do, we don't get the fact that the, you know, the, the, the reason that the ed tech product didn't work in that school was because all the kids walked to school through a gang area. Um, and so, so, so we just have to get more robust in understanding why we're collecting what data and, um, and, um, and, and then use it because because that's that's going to be when we really can see what works, what's what has the right efficacy, and um, and, and and get the cost right for what's being produced. So I'm, I'm not. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thanks, Ian. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm, I'm optimistic on this, but I'd love to see kind of the reemergence of uh, you know corporate training programs that really take responsibility for getting, um, you know, particularly um, new, or, uh, kind of early hire employees actually trainable um, and, and, and get that experience. And I think if employers are, you know, having thoughts that um, students are coming out of universities without the skills that they need to start a job, that employers will take on the burden for actually providing that training and, and um, giving applicants those skills. I think right now we're outsourcing that to kind of a lot of the um, both technical and non-technical boot camps. Um, you know, like the fundings this year that we've seen are like FlockJ or Multiverse are providing sales uh, or kind of other business white collar um, job skills. But it'd be great to see employers actually taking that on themselves kind of back when, you know, in the 60s and 70s, IBM 
was, you know, doing six month training programs and really expecting employees to kind of grow with, within their business. Yeah, I'll add a couple of thoughts here. Um, you know, one is on just kind of education on the K-12 side and, and higher ed as well in terms of, um, you know, rural or sort of, out of outside of, you know, major cities. Uh, I think that's going to continue to flourish in the next five years. We, we're seeing a lot of companies and a few in our portfolio uh, in, in Lilikotang in, in China and then U.S. and as I mentioned, uh, in Baijus as well, um, where that is a, a big focus for them uh, is to help serve communities that otherwise would uh, you know, lack access uh, to high quality education. I think that's only going to continue to push forward uh, meaningfully in the next five years. Um, agree with the uh, notion that on the ed, uh, corporate side and enterprise side, uh, you know, more and more sort of, um, you know, learning that happens on the job, uh, skills assessments, uh, as we talked about, and skills identification uh, will continue to have uh, real impact, um, you know, on the enterprise and corporate ecosystem. And then the last thing I'll just say is uh, I, I'm pretty optimistic and hopeful around just the, um, you know, talent flow that's happening into the sector. And so whether or not the dollar flow, you know, results, um, you know, in sort of existing investors, new investors, you know, success, not success. I think the, the, the one uh, the thing that will persist over time uh, is that, you know, we're just seeing more and more high quality talent, people, human capital talent uh, that is raising their hand and coming into the space. And so if there's anything that comes out of this pandemic that's going to be a very, very big positive is the, the number of um, talented individuals coming into the space, applying their experience, bringing their network into uh, the ecosystem. And I think that's, uh, you know, in many ways, what's going to compound uh, the growth uh, of the sector in the long term. And that's something that I'm, I'm very excited to see. And we're, we're seeing that, uh, you know, every day right now, you know, folks reaching out to us about, you know, opportunities in, inside our portfolio that are coming from, uh, you know, larger internet companies, technology companies, even frankly, non-technology companies. Um, and, and that's just really exciting to see for us. Yeah, Matt, I'll be super quick. I, re I remember a time when we talked about internet marketing and we talked about marketing as if they were two different disciplines. And I think, you know, now you can't talk about marketing without talking about digital marketing, right? It's, it's one and the same. Same for education. I mean, we still today talk about online learning and face-to-face -face learning as if they're two different things. And I, I believe, especially given coming out of COVID, that within five years, it's the same thing, right? Whether it's hybrid, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's fully online, we're talking about technology facilitating learning. And I think the benefits that come from that, especially with the large data sets, alluding to what Gene was talking about, I think we just get smarter and better. Um, and hopefully it's not this, this bifurcated conversation. It's, it's, it's one and the same conversation and we're all better for it. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks to each of you for joining us. This has been a great discussion and a lot of fun. Um, and, and, and thank you to, to our audience for joining us. Um, you know, certainly if we didn't get to your question, if you have follow up, feel free to reach out to, to me or the team at edX, um, EdTechX for, um, you know, any, any questions you may have. Um, also, if this was of interest to you, Next week, again, Cooley will be doing our virtual event series um, where we're going to do deep dives into investing trends um, and other, uh, other key um, uh, you know, areas of interest in you know, K-12 post-secondary workforce. Um, so uh, feel free to join us um, then as well. Um, and thanks for joining us. <laughs>